Welcome to this showcasing Impact Ventures session. I'm delighted to be your master of ceremonies for the day, uh, where we'll be inspired by the amazing pitches and social entrepreneurs that we'll hear today. Uh, my name is Philip Santos. I'm a professor at Catholic Lisbon and INSEAD, professor of social entrepreneurship. And I've also been uh, a mentor of the, of the participants in the Scaling Impact Bootcamp organized by the IB Institute. Um, when we speak about, we are all here with, with, with a mandate to create and develop a social investment market that can really support the work of social entrepreneurs and social innovators. But when we are in the early days of a market development, there are always difficulties, and sometimes the two worlds don't connect. We often hear the social entrepreneurs saying, I have this great idea, I want to develop it, I, I need support, but there's no investors out there that understand impact and can support me. And then on the other hand, we hear from investors, I have all of these funds and that I created and money to mobilize, but there are no investable ventures out there of entrepreneurs that truly understand scale and can manage their ventures. Of course, there is some sometimes deficiencies on one side or the other. There is no market connections. So it's fundamental to have these uh, accelerators, incubators, programs that support social entrepreneurs, that connect them to impact investors, that also uh, educate impact investors in terms of what they are expecting to align expectations. And this is the work that uh, the EIB Institute has been doing for the last five years with their program, the Social Innovation Tournament. And the ventures that you see are ventures that were selected as award-winning, finalists and award-winning in this program, and that went through capacity building and training in the context of the Social Innovation Tournament. The person that has been leading at the EIB Institute, the Social Innovation Tournament, is Luisa Ferreira, so I'll pass to her for a few words. Thank you, Philippe. So I would just like to walk you through what we do at the Institute in this uh, uh, domain. And, but I would first like to say, you have, as Philippe said, seven amazing pitches that you're going to listen to. That's one thing they have in common. The other thing is they are members of the SIT alumni network, and they've also been part of a SIT Impact Bootcamp. For those of you that don't know the IB, the European Investment Bank, it's the long-term financing institution of the European Union. And back in 2012, it was decided to group all our philanthropic work under the EIB Institute. And at that time, we had like a white uh, board to draw what we wanted to do in terms of trying to change or contribute to change the world for good. And we decided to start with the social innovation tournament. And basically, you know, it's a funnel approach, and we start with a call for proposals. We have now hundreds of applications. We select 15. Those 15 go through a first mentoring exercise that prepares them to improve their business plan, but also to how to pitch in a final event. And this final event happens every year in a different city, so it's consistent with our European mandate. So this year was in uh, Riga. Two years ago, it was in Slovenia. And the idea is always to bring some showcase to the country to give a message that this is a very important topic. In, for example, when we selected Slovenia, it was because the government was working on passing a law on social entrepreneurship and how the government could support them. Our vision has not changed, but the way we've been operating changed. So we started only with the money prizes. We've increased in the six editions the money prizes, but we also increased, more importantly, the type of prizes. So just to give you an example, we have now two, five, uh, two first prizes of 50K, two second prizes of 20K that have to be used to uh, invest in the project, but then we have a lot on mentoring. For example, we have a partnership with INSEAD, two projects will attend their ESEP program. We've, we give also mentoring vouchers that are targeted to some projects for them to develop the projects. We have started a partnership with EY in Brussels to, um, to help them uh, develop uh, the business plan. I was very naive, I must say, when we started this, and I thought, this is great, this will be enough. 
and everything will happen. It's not the case. So we decide to invest on the right hand side and say we need to have more things for the members of the alumni network, which are all the 15 finalists are automatically members of this alumni network. And one of the things we've started last year was organizing with Catholica Business School in Lisbon and uh, Philippe Sanz is the academic director, a one week program, which is an impact bootcamp. So all these seven projects that you have here are members of the alumni network, but they were participants. They are seven selected projects that were participating last year at this impact bootcamp. But we also think it's important you know, to establish networks, to give visibility and recognition to these projects. So when we organize events, conferences, we always try to bring as case studies some of these projects. We're also trying to establish some uh, networks with uh, major consultancy firms to work pro bono with these projects. It's ongoing work. And I'm going to announce you something that is going to be new next year, which is to have a new prize, which is an impact prize, that's going to be attributed to one or two projects among the projects on the alumni network. And I think that I've said it all. Now, I forgot something that is very important. To close the loop, you know, we've started uh, supporting an incubator in the north of Portugal. And the loop is in somehow closed because this year, because we want it to be in some way an export import uh, network of projects and at the SIT in Riga for the first time two of the prizes were a residency at the Irish which is the name of the incubator with the idea that these two projects will get support from the incubator to pilot and try their projects in the first in the region and then maybe in Portugal so that's closing the loop between the incubation and the SIT thank you thank you Luisa and I think it's, it's amazing the work that the IB Institute is doing in this domain of social innovation. And sometimes we need these institutions that have really long-term view to help catalyze the market. And that's the work that you have been actively doing as an, I would say, an entrepreneur inside the IB. So well done. Uh, our impact ventures, they are at different stages of development. Some of them are growing within their local markets. Some of them have a global uh, solution, a global platform that they are deploying. Others are replicating in different European countries. So my recommendation as you listen to these speeches is if you see a connection, if you are very interested in what they are proposing, if you see a connection to someone you know, to uh, your country, or you, you can open some doors, come to them at the end of the session, connect, exchange cards, and then network during the coffee break. So our goal with this session is really to promote a connection between the investors and the entrepreneurs. Sometimes we hear, we come to the EVPA conference, lots of great sessions, but sometimes we forget why we're here. We are here to support amazing social innovations, amazing projects, and this session helps us as a reminder of wh why we do the work that we do. Uh, just one more note, our investors panel. Uh, so we identified a few people that could contribute also to the session in their role as investors by asking the questions and interacting with the social entrepreneurs. Each one of them will pitch five minutes and then there will be five minutes for questions. We tried in the panel, and I'll bl briefly introduce each one of them before they start uh, speaking, but we uh, tried in the panel to have uh, the diversity of investors uh, and in, in, in our ecosystem. So some of them uh, like, for example, uh, Peter Ostlander and Javier uh, are directors and founders or investment managers of the uh, pioneer impact investing funds in Europe. Others have an important role as intermediaries. In the case of Marcus from F FASE, Jose Moncada from La Bolsa Social and Antonio Miguel from Laboratory of Social Investment, they are the people that are on the ground trying to connect the entrepreneurs and the investors and set up these customized financing approaches that align expectations on both sides and make a deal happen. This is, is a fundamental role in the early days of uh, an ecosystem. I would say that uh, Marcus and Antonio do that one by one uh, on, on the ground and Jose does that virtually uh, through a platform, uh, the first impact equity crowdfunding platform in Spain, which recently had an exit, the first exit with 80% return. So there are exits in the, uh, so well done. Um, and then we have uh, uh, on, the, on the foundation side, 
uh, Caroline, CEO of the Esme Fairbairn Foundation, which has been one of the pioneer foundations engaging in social investment. And also Melissa Kozak from the European Investment Fund, which is the wholesaler, the market catalyst that is supporting the other investors. So this is actually gives you a great spectrum of the different roles in the social investment ecosystem. With this, I would pass to the first entrepreneur, dear friend Hugo. Welcome. Hey, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Hugo. I'm one of the co-founders of Speak. Um, I'm very <laughs> privileged to be here, so thank you for giving us this opportunity. Today I'll start by introducing you to Fatima. Fatima is from Libya and she moved to Portugal. Um, and unfortunately, she didn't know anyone in Portugal, but she also didn't know the language, Portuguese. And those are two key things for so many things. So imagine yourself having to move to a new country, not knowing anyone, and not knowing the language of the host country. In Speak, Fatima not only learned Portuguese, but she also helped others learning Arabic, and she even met a person with the same interest in clothing, and they started the business together. Speak was created to help these people, people that, one, need to learn a language, and two, need to create relationships in the new city. And we are doing it. How? Uh, Speak connects migrants, refugees, and locals living in the same city through language and culture exchange experiences plus events. This is how it works. It's very simple. You go to our web platform and one, you sign up to learn or practice a language, and two, and this one is optional, you sign up to help others learning your language. And then the, the technology allocates you to two different groups depending on your application settings. For example, on Mondays, you might be on the French group learning French with local people, and on Tuesdays, you might be on the English group helping others learning your language and your culture. Along the process, uh, people not only break the language barrier, but they also break stereotypes, stigmas, the local people start to give more value to diversity, and, and basically they create a support network between them that works in a very efficient way. So actually, we are not the solution. They are, the, per the participants are the change makers, the ones that are helping each other when the other person needs it the most like solving simple problems, like where to buy cheap and quality food, to a little bit more complex problems, like how do I get access to the National Health Service? Or uh, how do I build a CV? Uh, can you help me prepare for a job interview? Uh, it just works. To deliver this experience, we use an online to offline model, just like Airbnb or Uber. Logistics, invoicing, applications, payments are handled online, but then the experience of learning, teaching, sharing, having fun happens offline in the real world. So online, we have a web platform that runs on desktops, but is mobile friendly, so it also runs on mobile devices. Then offline, we crowdsource unused spaces. This is where events and language groups meet. The way we make money is very easy as well. So a user pays 29 euros for 18 hours experience. Users that sign up to help others learning have access to everything for free. Events are free for everyone and there's a golden rule. No one is excluded due to financial limitations. Numbers look promising. We are today a global community of almost 11,000 people, representing 130 30 countries. Um, this year, we are closing with almost 2,000 applications for 18 hours language experience and 1,500 applications for events. This represents uh, uh, a growth of 20% year on year. In the end of last year, we closed the seed impact investment round of 500K to boost growth. This year, we are in nine cities, and next year, we expect to close in 20 cities. 
how can we help? How can you help, actually? <laughs> um, we are looking for strategic partnerships that can provide space in different cities where we believe the project is needed the most. We collect hundreds of success stories, but it's also very worth mentioning the changes that happen in the perspective and feelings of the users. For example, after 12 weeks, the feeling that the language is a barrier for my integration decreases 30%. The feeling that I belong to this city increases 15%, and so on. Uh, today, actually, I'm the only one on stage, but I represent here the global community and a team of nine uh, individual, very uh, committed uh, individuals. Um, and, um, and yeah, and this is it. So thank you and uh, share your world. <laughs>uh, once you unlock this barrier of language, then you can have access to many other things, education, work, integration, and so on. So, so I like it very much. So congratulations. I have a question for you. Uh, you have a very ambitious plan to, to grow. What would be the replication model in the different cities? How do you want to grow? So we actually um, are trying two different models at the same time. One is organic growth. So basically, we recruit a project manager that uh, takes care of the entry strategy to a new city, uh, makes everything that is needed, and then goes to other city and manage two or three cities in one time. That's organic growth. And the other model we are trying now is allowing people to take speak to their city. So imagine that in cities where, uh, that are in need of community-based solutions like ours, um, anyone can try to build a speak in that, in that city, and with that, allowing people to, uh, or creating societies that accept, value, and empower diversity. That's where we want to go. So basically, that's the second uh, model that we are testing. We closed um, two deals to test this in Portugal in two different cities, and uh, we need to iterate. It looks more or less like a social franchising model, the second approach. Thank you. Is there a second question from the panel? Who would like to ask an additional question? Anyone? Caroline. How much Caroline. Is the microphone. Oh. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, um, how much of your, how, how often do people then sign up for another 18 hours? So 50% um, of, if, if two people sign up today for 18 hours experience, one will, uh, will do it again. Um, the retention on users that sign up to help others learning, it's way higher. They stick with us one year in average. Could, could I ask a question about sure. uh, fees? You mentioned 29 um, euros to join for a, a learner. Is there, a, a, a do, the, do the helpers also receive a fee? Or no, no. is that used for setup costs? Yeah, so that's part of the experience. If you sign up to learn or to help others learning, if you sign up only to learn, you pay 29 euros for 18 hours experience. If you sign up to help others learning, you have access for free. You can also sign up only to help others learning. Uh, you have access for free, but uh, you, are not, uh, uh, you are not financial compensated. So you have trainings, 
um, you feel that you are making a difference, you improve your pedagogical skills, and that's usually uh, why they consider um, good for them, and that's why they are they stick with us, I guess. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. So Hugo, it's really an exciting model. Congratulations for developing it. So you asked for um, support uh, regarding uh, room spaces that you have. Is there also a capital need for further expansion in, let's say, the next two years? Uh, next, next uh, in the end of the next two years, yes. Okay. <laughs> so now we secured for three years program. This is year one. Okay. Yeah. Um, and basically, just to give more details on the partners we need, we, we manage, we crowdsource unused spaces. This means that at the moment we manage 200 partners at the same time with a really tiny team. We did a great work in optimization, but hundreds of partners cost us time and quality. So we really need to look for the big organizations that have office space across Euro European cities so that we can decrease the number of partners we are working with. Yeah. Thank Excellent. you very much. Thank you very much, Hugo. <laughs> so Hugo is, a, I would say, a great example of how a solution can be co-constructed with the beneficiaries and with the peers in the community, and how technology can actually lower the cost of delivery, because I know they lowered the cost almost 10 times between the manual way they were processing applications to when they started automating the process. So when you align co-construction, uh, involvement with beneficiaries and technology, we have really an amazing model. So next we have Progetto Quids. Thank you. Sorry. So, good morning everyone. My name is Julia Houston and I am Progetto Quids Development Manager. I am here today to tell you about our growth, our development and uh, our impact. Progetto Quid is a social enterprise that addresses two problems. On one hand, the high unemployment rate that affects social, uh, vulnerable social groups in Italy. It's the case of people with disabilities, with addiction, people who've been victims of violence, of human trafficking, and many more. Another problem that it addresses is the enormous amount of fabric waste that today's fashion industry creates. We don't have exact figures for Europe yet, but in 2016, the, U the US alone created 93 million tons of excess fabric that ended up in landfill or to be incinerated, which uh, creates enormous impact, negative impact on the environment. Progetto Quid offers one solution to both problems. We create we employ disadvantaged workers in the creation of uh, clothing and accessories. Um, the result are beautiful ethical fashion collections um, using recovered fabric, and this, for example, is one of the results. Uh, oh. And also the images that you can see here are from our latest collection. And this is where the magic happens. It's Pro Progetto Quid's production site in Verona. Here you can see some of the people who have found a chance to start over, thanks to their experience in Progetto Quid. The result are ethical fashion collections that carry a number of values. They are ethical, sustainable, made in Italy and unique. We recover fabric, the fabric keeps changing, so the collections keep changing. This dress is only available in this color in a certain amount of pieces, so it is truly unique. The business model that we apply is active in both the B2C sector and the B2B sector. In the first case, we, uh, the Progetto Quid designers uh, design independent collections that carry the name Progetto Quid and are distributed in our distribution channels. In the B2C, we collaborate with partner brands that uh, collaborate with our team of designers. They co-create capsule collections of accessories or garments that then carry our label, Progetto Quid, and their label of the partner brand. They are then distributed in their distribution channel, which allows us to reach a greater number of final consumers and create much more awareness around the topics that Progetto Quid uh, fights for. Um, as uh, you can see here, Progetto Quid has, uh, was founded in 2013 and it has since grown significantly. In uh, 2014, it won the European Social Innovation Competition. In 2000 and, uh, 
2016, it reached 1 million revenue and the break even for the first time. So it's profitable and it has been for over a year. Um, and in just recently, we were awarded by the United Nations the Momentum for Change Lighthouse Activities. All these results have uh, uh, been um, a consequence of our growth and the impact that we've proven uh, to have in terms of employees and in terms of revenue and many other elements prove our growth. We had five employees in 2013 and we reached 90,000 euro revenue. Today we have 80 employees and a forecast revenue of 2 million euro, uh, passing from last year's final break even in, in 2016. This was only possible thanks to the intensification of our commercial activities. We truly believe in the bridge between for-profit and non-profit sector. Um, in 2013, we had only one temporary store. Today, we have five Progetto Quid stores, over 40 multi-brand stores that collaborate with us across Italy, and one e-shop that opened last year and we collaborate with uh, over 10 partners. Some examples are Calcedonia, Intimissimi, Tezenis, you might have heard of them. Um, this is the team that led to these results. It has grown significantly just in the past year. We've gone from six members to today, actually, uh, 11. Um, and there are decades of experience in areas such as fashion, tailoring, marketing, business uh, and digital strategy. We have a plan, a three-year plan, to grow, and we intend to grow in terms of beneficiaries mainly, reaching 120 beneficiaries by the, by the end of 2020, with a revenue of 6 million euro. We intend to do that by supporting the uh, expansion of our commercial reach. In 2020, we intend to have a nine new stores, open up nine <laughs> new stores and um, expand uh, and increase the intensity of previous existing, previously existing partnerships and also reach out to new partners, as well as reaching out to the foreign market in 2020 itself. Uh, we are looking for support, uh, both financially with grants or investment and also industry insight and chances for networking and for collaboration in both the for-profit sector and the non-profit sector. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Melissa, we'll ask the, the first question. Melissa. Well, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I, I believe that I was on the review panel in 2014 when you were on the social innovation tournament and it's so impressive to see the growth of your company since then. Please, um, just speak a bit louder. Okay. Yes, and um, my question is exactly relating to growth and scale. What has for you been the greatest challenges and will, will, will be the greatest challenges actually um, for scaling at this moment? Okay, so 30% uh, of our revenue comes from the B2B, from the B2C, sorry, and 70% from the B2B uh, partnerships. That has tr truly allowed us to scale. When we started, we had one partner. Today we have 10, and um, we work on higher numbers with partners. That is uh, what truly allowed us to scale significantly. Uh, the challenge is to uh, continue addressing new partners and really offering us, uh, offering Progetto Quid as their ethical branch. So the future of Progetto Quid in our mind is to become the ethical branch of fashion companies across Italy and abroad. Um, and we believe that is the true challenge to uh, increase our impact. Further questions from other members? Caroline? Just, just one last question from me. What about sourcing? Has sourcing textiles been been difficult? It has been because um, we work with leftovers, which uh, clearly creates um, some obstacles in terms of quantity. We work on smaller quantities, working with partners. When we use smaller quantities of fabric, means we have uh, limited amounts of final products that look the same, but uh, we, um, our mission, our vision is to uh, create always unique products that are also resemble symbolically the uniqueness of our of our project. So the the sourcing of the material is our 
um, weak spot, but also our strong key. Uh, we are working on um, developing a system to deal uh, with a software to deal um, in a, a more substantial sub um, substantial way with uh, the um, shortage of not shortage, but limited amount of uh, quantity pair fabric. But we uh, keep collaborating with a greater number of partners that also uh, provide us with the leftover fabric that is uh, clearly supporting the growth too. Thank you. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit more about your employees? Of and um, just um, obviously very, very vulnerable people often need a lot more support because um, yes. their issues are quite complex. Um, so how you deal with that, mm -hmm. also what kind of package they get, do they get the living wage and benefits and things mm -hmm. like that, and also okay. are you planning for pathways for them into management, for example, so do they, okay. is there sort of a career progression okay. for them? Uh, so, um, we are a social cooperative and we provide the wages that are uh, in the national um, contract for wages but slightly higher uh, as far as support uh, in as um, in sectors that aren't work related we collaborate with the uh, associations and organizations that um, took them to us because we collaborate we have a social network a social network of our own uh, made of associations and organizations that present us with people from a certain group of people with domestic violence others from prostitution and we work with the operators that uh, introduce them to us um, on a day-to-day -day basis we uh, also plan on um, employing one person in our team that will uh, take care of uh, specific issues internally and uh, not only externally. Um, and uh, I forgot, sorry, the last part of the question. The pathway internally uh, has already actually uh, happened. We uh, have just recently, for example, uh, one of the, my colleagues that worked in the production site has now become uh, the manager of a um, pilot project that we have in a, um, in a prison in our province. And she now coordinates uh, the training of uh, seven inmates in Verona's, Verona's prison. But we also have had progression from uh, another few of our uh, co-workers. Um, there are also two people in the management team that come from vulnerable social categories. Uh, uh, we intend to in, in, uh, increase <coughs> this, uh, this sort of uh, path. Thank you. Thank you. Very good, have to close. Thank you very Thank much, you very Julia, much. wonderful. <laughs> this is really an amazing social enterprise that shows that not all investable opportunities are based on technology, but if you use cleverly the resources that society undervalues, uh, and if you uh, use them productively, you can have a, an amazing business. Next, we have Code for All, Diana. Good morning, everyone. My name is Diana, and I'm part of Code for All's team. Code for All was born out of a social no brainer. On one hand, in Europe alone, there are 14 million people that are not employed in education or in training. On the other hand, by 2020, there will be a need of 750,000 developers there. So we are tackling the skills gap with our 14-week immersive boot camps, where we transform unemployed people into junior software developers. We've already changed the lives of more than 200 people with a 96% employability rate. And this is saving our government almost 14,000 euros per student per year. So we know this is working. But we also knew we weren't getting to the root of the problem. UNICEF says we are having a global learning crisis because we are not reaching every child, even with a basic education. And this is costing governments worldwide 110 billion euros per year. So in 2015, we taught programming to children for the first time. And with the learnings we gathered, we created Blanc. And Blanc is a platform that has everything a teacher and a child can need to have a programming lesson anywhere in the world. From videos to games to coding sessions, we train the teachers on how to use the platform and we give them training content every single lesson so they will always know how to lead each one. We collect all the KPIs possible so teachers will have a, a real-time vision of their students' performance and we can improve our platform constantly. We own all the content and all the lessons are based on the sustainable development goals so children will become better citizens while learning how to code. And I would like you to get to know Blanc a little better with a video. Thank you, Louisa. Thank you. 
Blanc will be your travel companion to the incredible world of programming. In the classrooms of Code for All Junior, you will learn a lot of new things and overcome different challenges. You will discover videos and stories that will teach you programming concepts. The challenges and games you will find along the way will help you learn to think as a programmer, with or without a computer, and in the classroom or outside of class with your peers and friends. You will also have access to more information that will be useful on this journey. And at the end of the class, you will be able to tell your teacher how well you did. Blanc will follow you anywhere you go, in the car, at home, in the park. You will be able to connect and become better at the exercises you found most challenging, or do your favorite activities again and again. So, a study has proven that these children improve their logic reasoning and their math abilities from 9 to 17 percent, and their smiles also got bigger. But in the future, we want to measure the impact of these lessons in unemployment. So far, the platform creation has cost us half a million euros, and we are charging 50 euros per student per year, but we want to lower that to 10 euros when we scale. Our approach combines a business-to-business -business and a business-to-government strategy, but our end game is government adoption. We are now teaching children from 6 to 12 years old, but in the future, we want to create content for older children as well. Last year, we had a pilot with 2,000 children in Portugal, Poland, Italy, and Greece. And this year, we're having a pilot with the Ministry of Education and 30,000 children. But in, in five years, we want to be teaching 10 million children all over the world. And we want to reach developing countries because that's where we believe we will have the biggest impact. Because we believe in a world where everyone has access to top quality coding and citizenship education. So far, we've had the support of the Gulbenkian Foundation. We've had the support of several Portuguese municipalities. Actually, we have one of our biggest partners here in the audience, the municipality of Fundão. So if you'd like to address one of the questions to him, I think he will be glad to share the experience with us. We were the first social impact bond in Southern Europe with Code for All Junior. We're having our second social impact bond with Code for All boot camps, and we're applying to our third one. We already raised 1 million and 200,000 euros from Fundo Bank Mu and the social impact bonds. And now we're looking for an extra million, 350,000 euros from one or multiple founders to make sure the impact we're creating is delivered as soon as possible in different parts of the world. We're also looking for people with knowledge in tech education, networking and international, international markets. And we would love to have you with us on this journey. So thank you and welcome. Marcus, for the first question. So Diana, thanks a lot for the presentation, which Thank was you. really impressive. So congratulations on what you have achieved so Thank far with, with Code for All. I especially like the, the speed of expansion that you are uh, pursuing and also that you combine different financial elements. So I understand you did a, let's say, classical financing round, but also piloting or experimenting with the social impact bonds, yes. um, probably also to involve governments quite early in. And I also like that you are very explicit about your end game, which will be government adoption, if I understand you correctly. Yes. Uh, one question regarding the, the impact measurement. Can you maybe elaborate a bit more on how you do that and how that relates to your theory of change? I think you briefly mentioned two indicators, yes. but I just would like to uh, understand a bit more of that. So we have two projects running in parallel. We have the Code for All Bootcamps and Code for All Junior. In Code for All Bootcamps, we measure the, the percentage of uh, unemployment. So the, the social impact bond has a minimum of people we need to employ, and that's how we measure the impact. In Code for All Junior, actually Antonio Miguel who worked with us in the, in the measurement of the, the impact. So during the, the lessons, they, they measured the, the improvement of the logic reasoning and the math abilities of the students that were having lessons with us. And they realized that the students that were having Code for All Junior lessons uh, had better uh, had better grades in this area, and they also felt more motivated to to go to school. Peter, yeah. <coughs> very impressive story. Uh, There's one question I'd like to uh, understand: How you see the combination between your end game, government uh -huh. adoption, yes. and your investability? Yes. <laughs> So, um, so maybe uh, you, you yes. understand, yeah. So if you have equity investors, how does that work with your end game transferring yes. to government? 
because um, this is uh, impacting governments, like I said, with the uh, with code for all boot camps. The people that are uh, governments have to invest money in people that are not in employed in education or, or training. So this represents a cost for governments, and we're transforming that cost in a source of income. So a person that starts working uh, represents a, a gain of uh, six. 6,400 euros per year, at least in, in Portugal. So that is very uh, beneficial for, for governments. And with the children, we're working on this, uh, on this matter, but in the future. So in the future, we are hoping this will impact the, the, the employability of, the, of these people, uh, but a little far away in the, in the game. Any further questions? <coughs> Very good. Thank you very much, Diana. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> so another amazing pitch. Well done. And we have now Taya from Recicleta. Good morning, everyone. Did you know that in Romania, we only recycle 5% of the municipal waste, compared to 46, the European average? And we should get to 50% by 2020, because this is the, regu the EU regulation. Let's see what, how's, how's the reality on the ground. Let's imagine any one of you here. It's a flourishing entrepreneur. Uh, sitting in Bucharest with uh, 40 employees and you go to the office, you check your mails and you have some unnecessary paper. You put it on the bin and you want to do your bit when it comes to environment and when it comes to simple things like recycling. But what can you do when the waste management company takes everything together? Well, you could go from your own time a few blocks away and put your paper here. You are not even sure if this will be recycled. What would be another option? Well, you could go on the internet, check for a collection company, and you find out that the minimum requirement is at least 300 kilograms, and you don't have space for this. So it's another dead end. What can you do then? Well, one day a miracle happened. You're walking on the street, going to work, and you see this UFO type of bicycle. At least for Romania, it's UFO, yeah? <laughs> And it's written, we collect paper for recycling. So how this Recicleta could help you? Well, Recicleta offers a solution for both companies and households who are generating small quantities of paper and recyclable materials. What we do is that we offer collection bins, we offer educational materials, and we go to them whenever they call us. Um, what is innovative uh, is apart from saving time and space, is that we use this ecological transportation in a city, a very crowded city, and not only Bucharest, cargo bicycles. And these are ride by people from disadvantaged groups, which have a high unemployment rate. Um, Recicleta is a social enterprise developed by Future Plus, along with other initiatives. We have currently five staff members. I founded the Future Plus Association some years ago after working for uh, multinational banks, government, and other international organizations. But let's go back again to Recicleta. What we have developed so far is a different collection model in terms of waste management. And how this works, and we developed this model last year in December with, uh, in Portugal with Felipe, is that we have one geographical unit, right now is nine square kilometers, we have in the middle a collection point and the car cargo bicycles going five times a day and collecting from clients. This is serving around 50,000 people with zero CO2 and with an average of three kilograms per year per person. This is already 50% more efficient than the existing public service. But what we want to do in the future is to improve this system and shrink the area make it two square kilometers instead of nine, make 12 transportation per day, obviously having more clients in the same area, and also do some educational extra activities to increase the quantity to four kilograms. At that moment, we'll be 100% more efficient in terms of, in terms of uh, quantity collection, but also in terms of money savings for the government. Um, 
Our growth plan involves first in the first two years to validate this new model that we came up last year uh, and then scaling up. Hopefully this will happen in five years when we want to get to 30 units in Bucharest and this will cover more or less 25% of the area. Of course we can scale up also to other cities and other countries, why not? To make this happen, uh, we are looking for foundations that could come and join us in this uh, testing period in the next two years. We already have this year half of the budget secured by Kaufland Romania. We're looking for others to join. Um, we also have um, other initiatives apart from Recicleta on reforestation, environmental education and volunteering, so we could have separate discussions on this as well. Um, and these are some of the partners financially and also technical expertise entities uh, that work together with us in this journey and we hope to have much more from this audience hopefully today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Taya. Caroline, for the, the first question. That's um, really ingenious. Sorry. Um, I, I wondered, had you considered also going um, using growth in different types of waste? So, for example, plastic, mm -hmm. which actually is massively more environmentally damaging than paper. Um, and I just wondered if you'd thought about branching out in terms of other types of waste and also linking into your educational work. Do you look at education, educating people about actually reducing the consum reducing consumption in the first place? Uh, first of all, about the paper and plastic. We st when we started the project, we started with paper and for a simple reason. Um, because paper, when it gets to the landfill, it's lost completely. Maybe with plastic you can still have some chances of recovering even hundreds of years later from the landfill. But, but the paper is lost, you lost forest, uh, you have methane at the landfill and so on. So it's the most sensitive waste. But uh, we expanded from paper also with plastic and we collect other recyclable materials from companies because companies, they can put different bins in their office space. Um, with paper and the households that we serve, I forgot to mention that we have right now 300 uh, uh, client companies and 300 house of, uh, blocks of flats from Romania. Uh, we have, uh, the companies are paying us a fee of uh, 11 euros per transportation. The households don't pay anything. And we also sell the paper and also selling advertising space on the cargo bicycles. This is how the financial model works. Um, the bin for the households is inside the block of flats. So for the moment there, we can only accommodate for paper. So we had to choose and we choose this one because it's more secure the bin. Outside in the street, you look what, it's ha what is happening. Inside the blocks, the, the, locks, uh, the doors are locked and uh, the people take care more, they are taking more care of the bin. So that's why we collect only paper. But with companies, we collect all the recyclable materials. Further questions to Teresa Cleta, who would like to connect? Today. Yeah, w one question. Yes. Um, so you had, this is your business model. How, when do you plan to get sustainability? Uh, in two years from now, <laughs> based on that investment that we secured already half, uh, we improved that model in, um, uh, in December in, in Lisbon. We looked at that geographical unit. We didn't look at our business model uh, starting with, uh, we just had everything together. We cover a size of Bucharest, uh, but we didn't have that, uh, I don't know, the measurement unit. And right now, we organize it based on this geographical unit around one, car one cargo bicycle, one job. So we want to make that efficient and multiply it. And uh, hopefully in two years, at the beginning we need, uh, we need a grant, but uh, when the model will be proven and validated, uh, we generate also enough revenues to be stable and create profit. Uh, as Code for All, we also have two directions of development. Um, one is related to companies because they are paying the fee and it's a commercial, economical activity. And until the government will be open, because probably you know that unfortunately in Romania the situation is not that pink. Um, and <laughs> there are a lot of issues related to corruption, especially with uh, uh, state contracts. And waste management is dealt by the public government, the local government. So it will take us probably a while until this will happen. We had only a partnership with one small city in Romania until now that they were 
um, open-minded to start this um, this kind of program in their city, but it, they have 50,000 uh, inhabitants there. We hope to reach to more cities, and it will be a very much struggle in this direction. That's why we also look for expertise, um, who people who know how to deal with public partnerships, especially in the CE region, which is more special. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so until that time and will continue the struggle, we have to make financially sustainable the business to business model where we serve, where we serve the clients. And it's possible to be profitable and, and everything. The data is looking at us, but we need to make those improvements happen in the next two years. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Taya. <laughs> and next we have João Barash, Apps for Good. Oh, yeah. Morning. Thank you for being here. My name is João Barash. I'm managing director for Apps for Good in, in Portugal. And sorry for my voice, but <laughs> yesterday night was difficult. Well, <laughs> all over, <laughs> you know, all over the world, the education methods are, are, are getting uh, worse and demotivating students and teachers students get poorly prepared for the, for the real world. Some numbers, one of, of five students disapprove or drop out at high school. And in Portugal, we have the fourth highest dropout rate in European Union. Okay? With this in mind, do you believe is normal to have our children both happy and motivated to go to school? Well, in Apps for Good, we believe in that. Apps for Good is a course delivered in schools, a 30-hour course for children aged 10 to 18 years. In this, in this uh, Apps for Good, we have a competition, an option to a competition at the end of the, of the, the year. But for better understand this, let, him, let me present you Michaela. Michaela wants to solve the problems of old people isolated in hills and villages. He did our program during hold here, our five-step methodology that is quite a business, uh, a product development uh, course. And at the end, she has the option and her team to have uh, a competition. This competition is split in two steps. Regional events, where you get already different events with about 60 teams each and a final event where we have the final 21 applications. The teachers have access to a platform. They have face-to-face -face training and online training, and the access to a global community of more than 1,000 experts that bring the real-world context to the school. And what do students gain with this? Some important figures for us, if you can see, if you run from the green to blue, we increase in the communication and presentation skills, working in teams, and solving problems and other important soft skills that we have. Apps for Good, Michaela did Apps for Good in Portugal, but Apps for Good is spread globally. Began in England, with the help of Esme Fairman. Began in England, and in this moment, we have over 1,000 schools running the, the, the program. In Portugal, we began three years ago, we have in the last year 120 schools. We have already this year about 170 schools, and we reached some important figures for the Ministry of Education that is with us. Some of them, 40% of girls taking part, 51% of non-IT teachers taking part in the course, and we made last year with the uh, University of Lisbon a case study which proves that we had an increase about 10 to 20% in the performance of the, the, the STEM disciplines. Of course, we are delighted to have these partners with us, taking part to achieve these goals, and that is being very important to us. What they gain in return? Students fully prepared for the, for the, the, the job market. Well, what, what we need to do this and what our, are our plans? We aim to have 750 schools in this three years. For that, we are reaching for a partner in events management, a partner in impact evaluation, and 400,000 euros 
for reinforce, reinforce the team, to get more schools and to uh, develop our contents and processes. Of course, we have plans and we want to stay with us can be global because we want to take the next global leap and we are piloting in this moment AI and machine learning, which are very important for the tech education of the uh, young people. And that's it. If you believe that we can have people and students motivated and happy to go to school, stay with us because we are really already changing education. Thank you. Thank you very much, João. Uh, great presentation and great project. Um, so there's no doubt that learning how to code, uh, learning how to develop apps, doesn't mean that everyone is going to be a coder or an app developer. It's improving is the logical thinking and the reasoning skills and problem solving. So my, my question is, if you start working on that and you have a one-year program, how do you sustain the impact with children? So how do you convert these children to keep working with Apps for Good after the first year that they participate in the program? Yeah, well, that's one thing that we are working very hard, uh, even with the Ministry of Education in Portugal, because it's an important thing for us. We are creating what we call the continuity of the program. We are cre uh, uh, creating an event that's the, uh, what we call the App Startup, where we invite the, the teams for all, the, uh, all the, the, the years before to be present and to present to incubators, to investors, and so on. And we have a group of alumni uh, that are working with us in the events during, during the year, and that is working uh, very well. Other questions? Who would like to? Anyone? Caroline, any experience from the UK apps for good with, uh, with the Portuguese one? Yeah, Esme was, was, uh, was, was one of the, oh, well, it's the main fault of its existing apps for good. At the Maybe a quick question. Can you share a bit what your future growth plans and uh, expansion plans are on a regional basis? So I think you mentioned that you are currently operating in three countries. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, 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 we uh, globally we are we are uh, studying the, the, the better way to, to do it because we, we have different models and we don't don't want that uh, to make clones in the countries because its country uh, is its own reality. Then the Portuguese model is completely different from the the the, the UK model and uh, is much more similar for the for uh, for the United States model in this moment, okay? Because it's my more face-to-face -face and, and more supported in, in, uh, and more according to the ministry, okay? Um, but uh, mainly for scaling the, the, the project it is in this moment, we are, w in this moment we are 95% uh, uh, donations, okay? And uh, with the dimensions of these events and so on, we are, we are getting a way to have earned revenues, and that's very important for us. And in this moment, we are, we are planning that. Of course, we, are, we have difficult things, like the, 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 the presential training with the teachers, that is difficult to, 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 to scale because of the, cul the culture, the way, and so on. But we are, we are, we are trying to do it, and that's one thing that we, that we study already, even with the EIB. Caroline. Just um, is the 400 euros a grant, grant funding? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yes. um, just and the other ones for the other partners doesn't mean it, it, it's, it's money is much more knowledge and way to yeah. do it. Okay, in order to sell, for instance, the events. Um, just to say that actually, doing this in the UK made us realise we learnt from it as a funder <laughs> <laughs> to say actually we're not equipped as funders, especially I think foundations are just not equipped for the new world that's coming and that we have to get new skills and new understanding within the foundation world to understand these new all these all this new disruption that's happening in technology so for us we probably got more <laughs> learning from it <laughs> than than um than the grant gr grantee than apps for good did so it was very good for us so thank you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Really, what in, is in the base is the project methodology, the student-driven uh, learning, okay? That's very important. And in this moment, a, a big concern of the AI and machine learning that are very important for all the world and for us, but we have to deal 
with very careful from the 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 the, the young age uh, because it can be dangerous if we go on with machine learning and artificial intelligence without taking care of the algorithms and so on if not we can be bad things instead of very good things that this technology can bring us yeah. very good thank you very much well yeah. this this apps for good had a very interesting story because it came from cdi a Brazilian youth empowerment social enterprise through technology and they replicated in Europe not their normal program but an adapted program which became apps for good in UK and is now being replicated in a few countries and is particularly strong in Portugal due to the work that João and his team is doing which shows that there is value in replication as well okay very good next we have no it's not Miguel it's the other one uh, yes now a tour with Kwaiki. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I um, would like to appreciate to thank uh, Luisa Ferreira and Felipe for the great job they are doing with us, with all of us, and with all the social impact in, in Europe. Um, <coughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> Um, yes, in this five minute speech, uh, I will try to explain to you what does home delivery by people close to you mean. Um, the first problem we address is e-commerce deliveries, and this is the base of our business model. Um, any, any one of these images could be us. Uh, actually, uh, statistics state that one out of two people that bought online during the last year had some kind of problems uh, receiving parcels in their, in their homes. Problems like uh, late deliveries or not being at home when the parcel company arrives. And that's not a very good consumer experience when you buy online. Another uh, problem that we address is the pollution and noise in our cities. Uh, uh, the clouds you see there are o nitrogen oxide uh, particles coming from uh, diesel vehicles many of which are parcel delivery vehicles. Uh, employment rates among disadvantaged communities are very, very low. Actually, in, in Spain, in the uh, intellectual disabled community, employment rates of people who are able to work are 30% versus 80% in the rest of the population. But what is our business model? Yeah. It's very simple. This is, uh, we create a, a Coquis uh, microcenters network. This is an actual center in Barcelona near La Sagrada Familia. This is a center where the parcel delivery vehicle arrives to the center and delivers in a single drop all their parcels and then the vehicle goes away from the quarter. At that time, our Coquis uh, who are in that center uh, uh, make the deliveries walking on bikes or in electric vehicles and they work with a Koiki app. And as they are very near to the final consumer, they adapt to the consumer's needs. But who are the Koikis? Uh, the Koikis are people coming from disadvantaged communities like intellectual disabled, mental health, uh, risk of exclusion, and long-term unemployed. Actually, these guys you see here, all of them are intellectual disabled uh, boys and girls coming from entities in Madrid and Barcelona. Our business model, uh, who are our customers? Uh, online shops like Amazon, for example, parcel uh, companies like DHL, uh, final consumers can use our service and also the local retail. But Koiki is not only a network, a, a physical network. Koiki is an IT system uh, that allows the, Koiki, the, the network to operate, to deliver and operate and pick up parcels uh, to the consumers. We invoice our customers, the online shops, and we pay the network for their delivery work. <coughs> the e-commerce market is huge in Europe and growing at double digits every year. In Spain this year, for example, is going to increase at 18%. And this will create, by 2020, only in Spain, 15,000 new jobs. Who are our, our competitors? If we measure our competitors in two axes, in the vertical axis, we measure sustainability, and in the horizontal axis, we measure consumer experience like uh, trust or delivery on time. 
the traditional parcel companies like DPD, uh, DHL, FedEx, UPS are in the low left quarter, and all of them want to come to the up right quarter, where Koiki is already there, and all together with companies like Bubble Post in Belgium or Milkman Deliveries in Italy. We have a balanced team between people coming from the social sector and from the uh, transport and logistics industry. And uh, we have in our board five social impact funds, of which four of them are from the FPA, like uh, Fitras from France, Creas and ship to be from Spain, and Altre from Italy. Uh, we, we won the uh, social innovation tournament in 2015 for the European Investment Bank. And uh, we have this year, we have more than quadruple our K KPIs, like the number of shipments we have delivered, the number of Koiki centers already working in Spain, and the number of Koikis working in the activity. We closed a financial round uh, one year ago with these five impact funds of 600K. And we are very proud to say that we are part of the B Corp community. Uh, well, what we like uh, uh, for the future. We like to be more visible between the online, online giants in Europe, like Amazon, Bon Privé, or Salando. And uh, we have already proved our business model. We ha have already proved our impact. And we will uh, very much like to deploy our network in any uh, European country. Uh, well, and, and that's it for, for now. Thank you. So we have Javier Taron from Fitrust, who actually is an investor in Koiki, to do the first questions and comments. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, we, uh, we at Fitrust decided to invest in uh, Koiki for, for three main reasons. Uh, first, we were impressed to see uh, uh, a successful, uh, experienced uh, uh, manager uh, solving the last mile delivery issue. The second thing that we think this solution might be duplicated elsewhere in Europe, for example, uh, in, in France or Italy. And, and the main thing was the, the huge societal impact you have. And I would like, uh, please, uh, I talk to, uh, you to, to tell us a little more about the, the people you, you work with. Yes, uh, well, uh, we invest very much in our network. 50% uh, uh, of our payroll is people who are in, the, in, in, in Spain. Uh, training uh, the, the network. Uh, so, who are, who are the, the network? The network? The network are entities, social entities. In any quarter, in, in any quarter, in any city, in any village, there are social entities. Eh? And they have their users, they have their beneficiaries. And many times they are useless. Eh? They, they go to the center and they, 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 they spend their time there with uh, not much things to do. And we, uh, we give them the opportunity to work. So, we train those entities to develop uh, to, 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 to develop a new opportunity, a job opportunity for them. Yes, Peter? You uh, mentioned uh, that you uh, have already proven your impact and also proven your business model. Does it mean you are profitable at the not, moment? Not yet. Uh, and, so what is, uh, and what is your track to profitability? Uh, we, we expect to arrive to, uh, to break even in Spain. Uh, t t take, it, take into account that we are a very uh, intensive in capital because we spend a lot of IT and uh, we spend a lot in building a network. Uh, so we'll, we will be break, we will have break even in 2018, 2019, and we will need another extra uh, 300K to, to, raise, to reach break even. Uh, but we are sure of, of reaching break even because the model has already been proved. We have big clients like DHL, we have uh, Celeris, we have Privalia, a big online, a big online retailer in Spain, so the model is proved, uh, and it's only a qu question of time to reach break even. Are you selling at uh, market rates uh, your delivery services, or do your clients pay a premium for uh, the type of work you do? Yes, um, no. Actually, uh, we enter the market at the market rates, although our service is a premium service. Eh? Um, because it's a premium service, because we adapt to the consumer's needs. We go to your home when you want, so it should be a premium. But yet we, are not, we have not been able to take that premium, uh, because um, our, our customers, uh, uh, they, um, 
they are used to pay very low rates in Spain in the last mile delivery, and we have not yet uh, accustomed them to pay more for, for our service. But they will come. So your model obviously depends on a strong network in the individual cities. So can you maybe share a bit on the challenges on the scalability that that brings with your model? So are you planning to scale it also to further European countries or further cities? Or how is that, uh, how are you planning yes, on I, that side? In, in Spain, actually, we are now in 20 provinces, in 20 cities. Eh? Um, by the end of the year, we arrive, we arrive around uh, 30 new cities, 30, in total 30 cities in Spain. Uh, the the biggest issue in our um, in our scalability is that we have to train the social entity to a new job. Although it's a very simple job, uh, delivering it's a very simple job. We have to train the social entity, and that's the investment we have to do. The training. Final question: How how do you make the last mile efficient? Then, what are the key features of your service that makes you? efficient in that delivery? Is, uh, well, um, the, the, most the, the, the thing is that we are very near to the final consumer and that uh, our, our delivery is very short, in very short distances. So, uh, for example, in that Coiki Center that you saw, you saw in Barcelona, it's a one kilometer around. The, the, so we are very efficient delivering and picking up. Uh, uh, the, the, the more parcels we have, the more efficient we are. Okay, one last comment from Caroline. Um, how do you look, look after the safety um, of the people who are doing making the deliveries? You, and you, you yeah. mean physical safety? Physical? Well, or? yeah, any kind of sort of physical, mental. Um, they're very vulnerable people, so, ha, ha, you know, yes. that sort of support, um, wraparound support. Yes. Um, we, we have already more than 40 boys and girls coming. 80% of our coikis come from the intellectual disabled community, and they are very strong. They are very strong delivering. Once they have been trained, um, they, they make the work even better than uh, other people. Um, initially, they are supervised by their, own, by their own trainers, by their own social entity. It's the social entity who supervises them. Eh? But once they are trained, they, they did do it um, alone. Eh? It's, it's Excellent. Thank you very much. Now for our last speech of the day, Miguel Neuver, Colorado. Hi, good morning. I have some glasses here to this is not my put these glasses in your in front of your eyes. And the others don't feel discriminate. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, the microphone is not uh, open. It's now okay? Yes. yes. As I said, the others don't feel discriminate because in really, was, who was discriminated is the ones who have the glasses because they can identify the difference between these two images. Please tell me, where is the orange pencil? You understand, you, uh, you see the orange pencil. Now, you can take out the glasses and share for the others if you don't mind. And the fact, we are talking about color blindness. Colorblindness is a non-visible handicap who affects 350 million people in the world. And the fact is that be visible of the eyes of the others creates a lot of constraints in the daily life of the society. One in 10 men is colorblind. And I, as a designer, I decided during eight years to develop something to guarantee the correct integration of this, all of these people in the society without discrimination. It's very simple. The Colorblind concept is based on the old knowledge. All of us in this room have the, a little box of inks with the primary colors and the black and white. And which one of these primary colors I create a, a symbol, a graphic symbol to allow these primary colors. And in the same way we learn in the school to mixing the colors. If I mix the red and the yellow, I have the orange. If I mix the symbol of the red and the symbol of the, the yellow, I have the symbol of the orange. And with only three symbols, based on the concept of the color addiction, the colorblind people can identify all the colors. The black and white is the same way like in the, in the, in the paints. If I mix the white and the blue, I have the light blue. The white gives us the light tones and the black gives us the, light tone, the dark tones. 
This is my master thesis. I'm a designer and one of the most important ophthalmologists in the world, say, uh, one time ago, a very interesting phrase. They, 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 he said, the color as is the first medicine developed by a designer. But in fact, I have to approach this language for 350 million people in worldwide, but I don't know where they are because I don't have in the head. I'm a color blind. And the most easy way we find, the most efficient way and the most beautiful way, I, I, I think, is working in co-creation. We'll all the companies to guarantee that it's possible resolve the problem. Oh, I create a small team. We are a small team with uh, different skills and a social business model. Colorado is two organizations. One, a, not a normal company, work with a social DNA, and we work in co-creation with all the companies in the world who have the color as a factor of identification, shoes, or choice their product. It's simple, with only simple rule. This is not exclusive for anyone. And the, the, our business model, it's easy to, the companies pay us a little fee. And the value of the fee depends on the dimension of the company. Is indexed to the turnover of the companies. It's fair, a small software house here in Oslo pay a little fee and Microsoft pay a big fee. But in fact, after the protection of this project, the idea to guarantee the recognition of the different entities in the world. I'm the first Portuguese Ashoka Fellow. Colored is the first big corp company in Portugal. We have the recognition of Zero Project, a, a program developed by United Nations who, guarantee, who, who recognized Colored as one of the 53 best practices in accessibility. And we won last uh, September the, the second prize in the, in the so, uh, social innovation tournament. But also, all of this, I think the most important is the market. It's put the color red code in the product to guarantee the awareness and guarantee that it's possible to approach 7 billion people. Some examples, transports. The color red is already in use in the transports. More than 55% of the users in the transports in the, all over the world lose the color to identify different lines. The medicines, the hospital orientation, the triage of Manchester, this is all a real image. This is already implemented. We, during four years, we're testing the project in the most important Portuguese companies, not only in Portugal, but now we are scaling these good practices, these good uh, um, these pilots. Nutritional traffic light, the color is very important too. The textiles. More than 65 million of labels in the clothes is already we used the code in four different companies to guarantee that 94% of the users can have the independence to buy clothes or to choose the tie to have to dress in next morning. The color pencils. This company, for example, only the fact to put the symbols in their products. They recover all the Portuguese market of the first degree schools, now exporting for different 20 countries. I think this is the reason it's possible to put the companies making money and ma uh, 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 one's money and making the common good and the co-creation between the second sector and the third and the social sector is I think this is the key for a better world in the future but also for example this is the last our biggest partnership with Mattel Mattel uh, l l Lanso Launched. Launched in the last September in the United States, the first UNO with color red. In the first week, they increased their sales in 66 more than before color red code introduced in the game. The reason is possible to one's money making the common good. But the other organization, color red is two organizations that I said, one the company and the other NGO, work in the schools, pro bono, making completely a pro, uh, completely pro bono program, making the screening of color blindness with the young child, not only in Portugal, but in India, in Mozambique, not only making the color blindness screening to detect the previous, the color blind kids, prevent bullying, provide constraints, and offer for all school material with the code to guarantee that all of them can use the code without discrimination. This NGO is supported by the part of the license we sell for the companies. Now we are here. In the last, in the 2015, we developed with McKenzie our expensive model, our scaling model, and the idea is introduce more skills in our team, 
it develops more technolo technology supports and platforms for working for worldwide in the remote, remote process and, of course, in marketing, marketing and communication to guarantee that it is possible to approach to the big companies and create the effect me too. We imagine in the next four years, you can we can guarantee a more colorful world for all. Because color is for all. Thank you. <laughs> Peter, question is yours. Thank you, and a uh, big compliment for what you created, uh, a solution for an issue that doesn't stigmatize the people that are uh, handicapped in a certain way. Um, but the solution that you choose uh, is a big ambition as well, because you have to go everywhere um, to facilitate them. Um, and I see that you have big expansion plan. My first uh, ask, uh, my first question is, what is your ask? What is? What is your question to us? What you want from... Ah, wh what I want. <laughs> what we want. Yes. <laughs> I think it's not only myself, because it's difficult and don't have funny to make these things alone. But, in fact, I think the ambitions of this project is not how can we can approach 7 billion people. I think the most important goal in this, in this project is not only to talk about a non-visible handicap, completely forgotten of the society because the problem is not in the colorblind people because the solution is not in the colorblind people the problem is in the society because the solution is in the society <laughs> and all the companies all the entities have part of the solution and we use in good way of course the companies to make all the seven billion people know about this new language not only for colorblind people and if we want we have the contact of the big creative directors of the biggest companies in the world and with the role, this is not exclusive, if they use the code in their products, for example, like Mattel, it's possible the other competitors use the code too. The value is v of the, the, the license is very cheap. And what we need now, we need some money. I need some, I, I say some because we don't need a lot of money. Because the other part of the money is making with the license we sell. We need the money to create more skills in our team. We need money to create more competences because we are working for the worldwide. And the idea is to make all of us part of the solution, not only a singular persons, but the entities. And the idea is to work in co-creation with the companies, put the companies one's money and making the common good. I think it is a good solution for the, 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 the share value of all of these. But Mikael, tell, us, tell us how much money you need. I, <laughs> I have here a lot of money. <laughs> the, the, the plan we developed with, uh, with McKenzie, we need almost 350k for during three years, explain all of this project to find five, six, seven, eight, ten big players in the critical areas we, de we decide, like transports, like games, like clothes, like hospitals and health, and like... Uh, and then, in after those three years, you will be self-sustainable? You will be break-even or profitable? Colorado is already a sustainable company, but only our grow-up is completely organic. We live, in the last six years, only by the sales of the, the license we sell, but we need to run with more quickly, yeah. but step by step, we are talking about innovation. So one, one more, oh. am I allowed to ask one yes. more question? <laughs> short question and a short answer. Because, so, it, it requ it's a beautiful design, but it also, it requires to teach those 350 million people that are colorblind. Um, to teach them, to teach them about this how code. to use it. I think it's easy, because if you, if you open this box of Mattel, they have they they teaching for the people what represent Colorado in their products. If you look for this <coughs> box of pencils, they teaching the code. If you go to a metro station, you have the information now what means Colorado in the metros in the hospitals. You have the information what means Colorado in the hospital. It's not me to learn to teaching all of the world. It's the companies and the area I see of the companies gain another 
interest. It's not only to give some for the others, make something. No, it's become the company's part of the solution. And I think this is the idea in the, the mom, at this moment. But also, Colorade, the project we have in the schools, well, you have already mm -hmm. done. <laughs> Colorade in Portugal, for example, is already teaching in the schools. All the school manuals of the, of the, the, the first degree is already teaching the code for the young child. I, I, I don't have doubt that this project is not for now, it's for the next generation. But we have to begin in some way. Yeah. And now I think it's the right moment in the schools for the young child and in the, so the products for the society. Yeah. This I'll cut you down. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, I'll take just two minutes more before we, uh, we close the session. But first I would like a huge round of applause for our social entrepreneurs. <laughs> who came all the way from their busy work, developing their ventures to be here and share ideas with us. And also to our investors who uh, made pointed and re relevant questions for them. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I don't want to hear anymore that there is no investable impact ventures. Maybe in the past there weren't, but you all sense that the world is changing and that the social investment market is becoming a reality, both on the financing side with more funds, more expertise and better line expectations, and also uh, a pipeline, a stronger pipeline of social enterprises, social innovators that understand business, understand impact, and are trying to make their models sustainable. So I think we all need to work in terms of the matching, uh, in terms of the capacity building, but the, uh, I think everything is there, both the talent, the entrepreneurial talent driven by impact, and uh, the financing and the desire to achieve impact and return, or, uh, or focus only on, on impact, but be able to measure it. The role of people like the IB Institute and the work of the Social Innovation Tournament is uh, very important for this market to create. So I'd like to appreciate the amazing work that Luis has been doing, pushing the IB to be focused on social innovation increasingly and build this ecosystem. Thank you, Luisa. Thank you. As a final word, so I'll just ask you to fill an evaluation form. Just one page. You just need to put some crosses. It's very easy. It's on your chairs. Um, actually, in, on the top, just say who you are. I am an investor, I am an intermediator, I am an entrepreneur. So just say in one word your category so that we can understand your question. Okay. You can deliver this at the end or leave in your table. And I would like to also thank EVPA for the opportunity to host this session and hope more to come. Thank you very much, everyone.